All right, we've been doing a whole study in a new series. I like to teach in series. Can anybody tell me why I teach in series? Because we grow in series. You ever notice that? We're like a tree planted by the waters, it says, right? And it says our leaf will not wither. Our fruit will bear itself in its season. And whatever we will do will prosper. Why? Because the water is the water of life that flows from heaven and it flows through Jesus. How many have Jesus in your heart? Amen. Great. Aren't you glad? All right. Why do we plead the blood of Jesus? Do you guys have an idea? Well, pleading the blood of Jesus, the word plead is an old English word which, which means declare. To declare the blood of Jesus. Now, when you're in a court of law, the, the court gives you a chance to declare whether you're guilty or innocent. We are innocent by the blood of Jesus. Can you say amen? But what well, a lot of Christians don't know, and you can take this home with you, brother, is that when Adam and Eve first sinned, God had to sacrifice an animal because blood is the only thing, now listen carefully, that can shield man from the glory of God that would kill him and shield God from the sin of mankind because what is sin, everybody? We found out. You guys are learning deeper Sin is not just making a mistake. It's the nature of Satan in your flesh. That's what causes you to age. Lose our hair. Sorry. You know what I mean? Causes us to periodically get sick, and that's why we're to believe we're redeemed from the curse. So the blood of Jesus is a shield that shields us, that allows us entry into the presence of God, into the kingdom of heaven, allows us to be able to move in and out. The Bible says that when we have Jesus and we follow the shepherd, he will lead us in and out. Hello. In and in, more of God and out of this lost and dying world. So the blood of Jesus shields us. Now, if we go over quickly, if we walk in the light, the Bible says in 1 John, Verses 5 through 7. If we walk in the light, who's the light? God is light and he is no darkness at all. Jesus would work. We walk in the light as Christ is in the light. Listen, the blood of Jesus is applied to us every day. So when you get up in the morning, present yourself to God. Say, Lord, I present myself. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Help my words and my prayers not be go unhindered. And Lord, I thank you that I'm in your, blood, in your presence. Immediately, the blood is applied to you. You're cleansed. You're washed. God puts you into Christ. He moves you into the spirit. And from that little place of presenting yourself to the Lord, you have now been tuned up, tuned in, and you are ready to conquer your day. But most Christians, well, let me say maybe half, not to put anybody down, they don't do that. They don't present themselves to God. They only go to God when they're in trouble. Well, everyone say, oh, me. Go to God first before you're in trouble. You see, in my conviction, in my walk, I went to God some years ago, and some of you know me. Peggy, you know me. You've been with me, I don't know how many years. But anyway... You know, uh, all my preaching and teaching comes from the firm foundation of the Word of God. I don't want us to get away from the Word. How many know you really can't get away from the Word? We know, and who's the Word? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was? God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And you've heard me say this many years. If the Word was God, the Word still is God, the ultimate authority. And so what we need to do is we need to realize that in him we move, in him we live, and in him we have our being. But you've been scattered in Adam. You have three parts of you that want to go all of its separate ways. You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in an earth suit, your body. Your body needs to be harmonized, your soul needs to be renewed, and your spirit, now that it has Jesus in it, needs to be kept in a condition of being exercised with the anointing. So I'm a spirit being. I have a soul. I'm a personality. And I live in a nurse suit. It is my responsibility to bring myself before God so he can keep me running in flow and in sync. Hello? There's a harmony in walking with God where the blessings of God follow you. 
It's called grace. And when our life is presented to God, then he's in charge of keeping us in grace. Can you say amen? You see, one of the greatest fallacies that a lot of churches and, and people and Christians, and I'm not putting anybody down, is we try hard to serve God, don't we? We try hard to be in fellowship with God, to pray, don't we? Isn't that great? And I, you, I commend you for it. But God interrupted me one time. I was telling him about how you've taken care of me and you walk with me. And he says, son, I need you to do something for me. How many years ever had God interrupt you when you're praying and stuff? He says, son, I need you to do something for me. I said, what's that, Lord? He says, I want you to teach my people they don't serve me by their natural man. They need to surrender to me on a daily basis and allow me to lead them so they serve through me in life. They serve through me in life, not for me only. Did you get that? So we work hard to serve God. And stuff, but sometimes we wear ourselves out. Why? Because we're using natural energy instead of the supernatural God that's on the inside of our heart that literally guides us, orders our steps, gives us vision. My goodness, we're the children of God and Satan has already been defeated. So we need to live like that. We need to present ourselves to our Father. We now let him not babysit us like most of the church does, but instead to guide us and make us mature, that we would grow up into him, going back to the tree. You are that tree that's planted by the rivers of water. And you grow in four areas. You grow in depth, length, breadth, and width. Everyone said depth, length, breadth, and width. See if you can get it real quick. <laughs> Those are ways in which we grow. We're like a tree planted by the rivers of water. We're the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, Isaiah says. So when we're planted in Christ and we present ourselves to Christ, we develop in four of those areas, in depth, length, breadth, and width. So let's define them real quickly for you. Depth means stability. Your root system needs to be deep into God. Unmoved, unplucked up. Can you say amen? Width. Width is your character. Trees grow in width, don't they? Not only depth, but width. So that's our character. Have you developed, have you become more of a mature Christian lately than you ever have been? You're supposed to do that. You're supposed to, in character, develop. You're not supposed to be just a character, like you and I are, Caleb. But... but to be growing character, which means we don't give in, we don't quit, we don't run the other way. Listen, God didn't bring us this far, and this is a message for somebody. He didn't bring you this far to have you go back to Egypt. Don't you dare go back. The Israelites kept on saying, oh, when did we go back to Egypt in my old ways of life? You want to die and go to hell? Don't do that, okay? Let's not turn back. Let's not look back. Let's develop in our character. Not only that, but then it says in height. Doesn't it say height? That's our spirituality. We're developing spiritually. You should know more today than you did yesterday. You should do more than you... You should do more today than we did yesterday. Why? Because we understand more than we did yesterday. And we're to grow in the Lord and understand it. Can you say amen? And not only height which are spirituality, okay? But our breadth, our, our endurance, excuse me. So there's, what is it? Depth, length, endurance, bre uh, breadth, and uh, height. So we're talking about endurance. How many here know that we're not running a sprint? When you see that scripture, it says in James, let us run the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus. Lay aside your weights and sin. That so easy. It's taught the race is our life. Everyone say the race is my life. You're running a race and you're in competition. Look up at me. Did you know you are competing against something? Yeah. A couple of somethings. Number one, you're competing against the enemy trying to keep you on this planet. How many here, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My 
home is laid up way beyond the blue. The angels beckon me through heaven's open door, and I don't feel at home in this world anymore. You see, so as closer as we get, God is developing us. And then he helps us with endurance because we're not running a race that is like 100-yard dashes, not, not from victory to victory to victory. That's just silly. We're running our entire life. And the first thing that God told me, he says, if you want your life to go well and you want me to win your battles for you, you've got to turn your life over to me on a daily basis so you don't take back in control your life. Now, how many here's taken driver's ed back in the day when they actually went on a drive? Remember those days? Yeah. I had a nervous driver's ed guy. My dad had taught me a lot of stuff about driving. And so I was overconfident in every car. I probably was an awful driver. But there was this guy next to me that had the double steering wheel. You remember? He had brakes, set of brakes, too, and all that. He would, whenever he, I thought I was going to overcorrect or something, he'd grab the steering wheel and pull it to the side. Listen. We're in competition with our flesh as well. Your flesh wants to serve itself, wants to live for itself, wants to <sighs> accomplish things. It is a noble thing to feel that way. But the problem with that is we can't do it without God because we'll mess it up somewhere. So the most sobering thing before we get into our lesson is to realize that take heed, you who thinks you stand, Lest you fall. And don't think more highly of yourself more than you should be thinking, but rather think soberly as God has dealt to everyone the measure of faith that you need to get you over in life. Can you say amen? I added those. We've been doing a series called Reigning in Life in Christ. And we're going to talk about today godly contentment. Everyone say godly contentment. Paul said, I learned to whatever state that I'm in, therefore to be content. Evidently, he didn't live in Alaska. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> That's for you, Christy. I, Alaska's pretty. But he's saying, whatever condition I'm in, I've learned to be with God in such a way that it doesn't affect me nor cause my decisions to be affected. Yes. Hello? God wants us to get to that place where circumstances don't dictate to us, but we go to God on a daily basis and he shares our day with us. And he tells us, hey, you just go ahead and you walk in faith. You trust me. Don't lean to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge me or talk with me throughout the day and I will direct your path. Wow, that's really good. So as we've been doing this particular study, we want to share some really neat things. So we're going to turn and read our scripture to you, two of them, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and Colossians chapter 2. Let's go ahead and read these. I'm going to read them, and then you just follow along. Sometimes I'll say together, and everybody reads with me. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, 
and is certain we can carry nothing out. And having then food and clothing, with these things we shall be content. Now, contentment doesn't mean the outward things. It's talking about your walk with God. Because somebody that walks with God and gets close to God knows that God is all about seeing to our need. God shall supply all of our need according to his riches and glory. When you walk with the king, you get all the king goodies. It falls off. It's called grace. We have a kingdom that you and I walk in. I try to tell people this often. We don't live in the world economy. We live in God's economy, which means that even if gas is 12 bucks a gallon, he would see that you have enough money to take care. Why? Because you and God are buddies. See, that's the, that's the key. It's not trying to get your needs met. That's natural. It's getting with God, and he will promise to meet your needs. Now, I want to tell you, has God ever disappointed any of you? No. But the way the devil would talk and the way people talk sometimes make you think that sometimes he doesn't come through. Here's another one. Don't mix the covenants. In your Bible, you have two testaments, don't you? Another name for testaments is covenant. Two covenants. An old and a new. new. Now, I'm not going to preach any new doctrine to you, but I'm going to give you some wisdom. You cannot operate under an old covenant if there's a new one that replaces it. If you do, you fall from grace. So, if people in the old... Now, listen carefully. People who are Christians in the New Testament have Jesus in their heart. Now, listen carefully. Go to practicing Old Testament principles and law. What do you think will happen to them? They'll come back under a curse. Read Galatians. Read the book of Galatians. It warns to not try to bring before God his old covenant, which is obsolete, he says. He's replaced it with a better covenant, with better promises. So what do we do, Pastor Kerry? We take what we can learn from the old covenant, we bring it into the new, and we put Jesus in it. Hello? And we bring Jesus, and he walks us through the new covenant. And see, this is what the enemy does. He's a master at deceiving. Why? You know, when we had our house built, I lived in a trailer. We're talking about way back when I had one of my first house built. I lived in a trailer. The trailer is like the Old Testament. I can't wait till the house come along. So what the enemy does is he gets us to focus on Old Testament teachings, Old Testament things, the do's and the don'ts. You've got to remember one thing that people in the Old Testament did not have that you and I have. That's God in our heart. They weren't born again. They didn't have come. Jesus hadn't died and rose again. So we've got to be smart Christians. We've got to understand what our covenant is. And when the enemy comes to try to steal, kill, or destroy, we hold up our covenant and we sit Jesus on him. You see, when I fight, I fight with rest. I fight not as one beats the air. I release the anointing. And the anointing is a smart bomb that decks the devil every time. But what we do is we try to tell God how to do things. When we pray, don't do that. You're learning new things today. Some of you have heard this a while because I've been preaching this a little while. No, you don't tell God how to answer the prayer. You just tell him you want him to go in and answer the prayer. Because when we tell him what to do, Kevin will limit him. Because he honors our words. Our words are like, let's say you got a a lake of water, and it's in this nice clay pool, and you want the water to go somewhere. What do you do? You make a groove and you, so that the water will fall out, groove that little stream, that groove, wherever you want it to go, irrigation or whatever. Can you say amen? amen. But that's what our prayers are. Our prayers are us making grooves for God to flow into those areas. Lord, I want, I want so-and-so, Jane Doe, Lord. 
I've seen them the other day, and they look so beat up. You know all about them, Father. Their angels are probably bound. So I claim their salvation. Now I bring and ask you to go in, flow into their life. And begin to bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I bind all the demons that's been working. And Lord God, I release their angels because everyone has angels. But they won't work unless we're in the word. So I bring the word on behalf of them. That's what intercession is. You are bringing somebody before God. And you're giving God inroad and invitation. How did God get in your heart? You invited him in. How's God going to get into your family? You're going to invite him in. God doesn't act on his own. He already did that. His name was Jesus. Our job now is to bring his covenant into the areas which are dark or without God into our family members that don't know how to ask or pray for themselves. Isn't that great? And then we serve God in the spirit of things and not out of, oh, I forgot I need to pray. God's got a word for you, it says. That is, there's been witchcraft put on you, and God has broken that power. And he's going to do a miracle in your home. In, in, within the next two months, you're going to see changes come about. Now, you get the oil out, God says, and you anoint that house again. All right, will you do that? Amen. That's why you were attacked, and you fell, and you didn't know why. That was a spiritual attack. It won't happen to you again. Say Amen. And if you go to the doctor, they're probably going to give some name to it. You got booba da bee bee, you know. <laughs> and boy, now you got to take some drugs to take over the booba da bee bee. You know what I mean? I see. I haven't changed much, Kevin, except for a little. You know what I mean? All right. So let's get into this lesson. So, all right. Let's continue to read. Okay, Colossians two nine and ten. For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. For who? Where? Everyone say, in him. him. Say, I'm in him. I'm in him. him. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are what? Yeah. The word complete means absolutely made whole in him. Who is the head of all principalities, archons, and powers, authorities. So guess what? He who dwells in you is greater than he who dwells in the world. The problem is, we're not letting Jesus lead us. We're sort of walking around hoping God's going to intervene. Listen, I told you last week, we're going to share again this week. The Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not. In order for that to happen, you've got to follow the shepherd. By the, by the Spirit. You have, that means, Kevin... That means, Sherry, that means, Linda, we got to follow Jesus. You should see the back of his head. Hello. He should be leading your steps. Remember, you see through Jesus, so even though you see the back, the idea is to give you a, a vision that we follow Jesus. We don't run ahead of him. We don't sit down, think of ourselves, and go, oh, woe is me. You died. Dead people don't get upset. Dead people are not thinking about their selfishness all the time. Dead people can't be irritated. You can't insult me. I'm a dead man. The Bible says if you choose to follow Jesus, you must first deny yourself. Take up your cross, your death, and follow Jesus. Why? Because there's something that always interrupts Jesus, and that is us. Our flesh always gets, seems to get in the way. So daily, get yourself crucified. You go before God, say, Lord, I lay my body down, a living sacrifice, crucify me, and look, put to death that man, so that when I get up, I'm getting up in you. Then miracles happen. Because it's no longer you that's doing it. God's doing it through you. Say amen, somebody. All right, did we finish all of our our, our scriptures? Good. We're going to cover these four areas. Write this down. We're going to talk about today, God gets me through it, being balanced in our walk and flow. Being balanced. I think something, uh, the enemy really wants to get people out of balance because if he can do that, then you're going to self-destruct. Okay, two, we're going to cover keeping our priorities right. Everyone say priorities. 
Then we're going to cover three. Our witness and our behavior before others. How many know we are a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection? When people look at us, they shouldn't see compromise. And then fourthly, press onward and upward. Listen, God took you and loved you right where you were at. And loved and conjules you. And you do not, you do not repulse him. It doesn't make him look bad. He just loves us. He's got to get us to surrender and be in the blood so he can fix the problems of our life. If we're unwilling to allow him to fix them, then it cannot be fixed on our own because willpower won't do it. And some of you that try to, you know, quit smoking or quit doing this, quit doing that, just on willpower alone, you know you might have some successes, but then it goes right back into the problem again. We need Jesus to step us through life. That means slow down. Get in the sink of God. He's not in a hurry. If you're praying, he will let you know what you need to be doing here shortly. Remember, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will guide us into all truth. He will guide us into how to experience it, how to enjoy it, have the fullness of our walk with God. Say amen, somebody. Woo! So those four things we'll cover again are being balanced in our walk and flow, keeping our priorities, number two, right? Three, our witness and behavior, and four, press onward and upward. You ready? Yes. All right. Hope you take out notes, and if not, I'll give you a set of these notes if you'd like. We always offer notes if you need them. Okay, number one, being balanced in our walk and flow. Go with me to Ephesians chapter four, please. Look at verse 11 through 16. I read from the New King James. I just picked that one. That was a good one. There's some wonderful translations. We do recommend that you have, find a Bible that you use and then other translations alongside of it. Remember, some are up paraphrase and some of our, our translations. Some good ones out there. Okay. Ephesians 4 verse 11. And talking about Jesus, and he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints. Everyone say, I need to be equipped. I need to be equipped. See, equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. My job is not to do all the work here. My job is to train you so that you do the work of God. Could you say amen? And if it's a good church, this is a good church, then therefore there's all kinds of things that we can be a part of. We can help within our own gathering and body. Can you say amen? Then it goes on further. Equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Edify means building up. To a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. How many here... I've, I've arrived. So God is still growing us up, isn't he? He's still teaching us. So your, one of your praises in the morning when you meet with him is, Lord, I want to learn. Teach me, teach me, teach me. Lord, take off some of the bondages I have and preconceived ideas and open my eyes. Oh, he loves that. He says, oh, goody. Folks, you forget. How many here remember a guy named Enoch? He, remember Enoch, fifth from Adam? Hello? I don't know if it's fifth, but from Adam. What did God do with him? God just took him. His wife, his life so pleased him. See, he's a type and shadow of the church. His life so pleased him, God says, ah, boop, took him. Now, that's what God's going to do with you and I one of these days soon. I believe in a pre-trib rapture because I've gone to know my father so well. I know my father will never turn us over to the devil. So you got people out there teaching you're going to go through the trib and it's going to be this, it's going to be that. Now listen, they're reading the Old Testament too much and they've forgotten their first love. Jesus would never do that. He says, I'm leading you out, not in. <laughs> There's a lot of bad teaching out there right now. And you know, the problem is we don't know our Bible like we should. You should know the dispensations. You should know the covenants. You should understand why things are done and, and have enough knowledge, workable knowledge, that you can help someone else understand as well. Have you been helped yet? Yeah. 
not only that, but I want to take, we're going to teach you how to release the anointing, how to lay hands on the sick. I want to take you into areas where a normal church doesn't, and the reason why they, they just can't. You can't take all those people into special classes. You have to attend a special class. Well, here, this is one special class. Can you say amen? amen? Have you learned anything already? I know you have. All right, not because of me, because God wants us to. All right, so let's continue on. And it says, till we all come to the unity of the faith. You think the body of Christ is unified yet? No. And of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect, the word perfect is teleos, means mature man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I haven't got to his fullness yet. Have you? Then it says that we be no more, and this is what I want to get us, no more children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, by the slight and cunning craftiness, whereby men lie in wait to deceive the stupid and innocent. I put those words in there. God said, in the last days, there's going to be a lot of deception out there. And as, as a pastor and somebody that loves you, my job is to get you to focus in on Jesus because he is your balance he is your focus, and he is that very power inside of you that keeps you in line if you listen to him. Hello? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. The word maketh means he changes my mind to want me to lie down in green pastures. The word maketh is an elusive word, has a lot, about eight meanings to it. One is changes, changes your mind, alters your thought. Hello? He maketh me. So God, how many know God doesn't force you to do anything? So there has to be a better understanding. He so convinces us, just lie down and let me have you. No, not lie down and give up. Lie into my arms and rest. Come unto me, all that labor. All that you would come unto me. Oh, that you would come unto me. I have so much to show you. Didn't Jesus say, I have so many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now? Well, the church is getting to a really wonderful place in God. And you guys, being that you've learned a lot already, are growing up in the Lord, and, and you're in that sweet spot. Everyone say the sweet spot. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a mover when I sleep. And I have to find that sweet spot where I just go off. Now, I don't know if you can identify with that or not. Well, the same with our walk. You need to find that rhythm and that sweet flow of God. God will take you there, but you need to ask him. You can't. We have not because we? We have not because we? Well, I don't want to bother God about that. Well, listen, you're never going to taste it then. Without invitation, God cannot trespass. Hello, we have had church so far. Yes. That we'd be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. God wants us to grow up into him whereby each one of us as members of his body, we supply other things to one another. In other words, we don't let somebody sit and, and their life's falling apart and we don't say anything or we don't do anything. We don't say be warmed and filled and I hope you make it. Yeah. No. Right. We try our best to reach out and, and touch lives and do our best. God's got a great vision for this church. Do you know it? Right now we're under construction. Some things got damaged. So we had a COVID thing. Now we're blossoming and growing. I mean, food pantry, evangelism, getting on the streets. Let's get ready. Let's start praying. Say Amen. All right, glory to God. A couple of points I want to give you. God will help us to become balanced in our walk, folks. But we must ask God and then allow him to bring us to that place. We, then, after we've asked him, listen, stay out of the way. How would I do that, Lord? Well, if you think you're in the way sometimes, just say, Lord, help me to get out of the way when you're working in my life so I don't take back control. Two, the word uh, self-control is also the word balance. 
Everyone say self-control. Now, here's the fallacy. Somebody would tell me self-control means be in control of yourself, right? Kind of. But how many here know if you could control yourself, then you wouldn't need Jesus. So self-control is really having yourself under control, under whose control? Come on, God's control. It's turning your life daily over to him and letting God be in control. Now, listen, God does not overlook anything in your life. The reason why our life might not be as blessed as we really like it to be is because we've been in the way. So you ask God, God, get me out of the way. Keep these things flowing. I want to so shine before men. Like you said in the word, you said if my life and my work so shine before you, you will glor- men will see that and glorify you. We're going to read that scripture in a little bit. So another thing, so don't be in the way. Ask God to help you. Remember, everything that you fail at, God is right here to make up the difference. But you got to ask him. The Bible says that confession means to say the same thing. So if you sin, it says to say the same thing. Sin will drive you to the wrong place. So you confess your sin, and God is faithful and just to forgive you your sin. It's like admitting faults. Listen, all of us have faults. Don't dwell on them too long, but be willing to admit them if somebody calls you on one. So I notice you've been really fleshing it out lately. No, I haven't. Uh, about that time, I know enough, about that time, I just be quiet. Because remember, Satan likes arguing. He feeds off of arguing. And it doesn't matter if it's over a football game or, or the fact that you, you like blue ink on your pencil or your pen. And some people like black ink. I don't Open the egg at the small end or the big end. You, you see what I'm saying? The, Satan sets that system up so that we... We chide and slap each other, see? And then he sucks the energy off of it and then attacks us with it. Don't give the devil what he wants. And that is to argue, fight, get yourself before God and let him prune and tune and get you ready. And you'll thank me later if nothing else. We'll get around and dance around the throne and say, man, I'm so glad you told me that I was my worst enemy. Nobody else bothered to even say anything. And moving right along. Four, we are to allow God to balance us. We can't do it on our own. Balance doesn't mean walking a tightrope. Balance means you can't pour out more than you have coming in. Balance means you don't get in your car and start driving off to do something without praying. You balance things that are coming in with things that are going out. How many know you don't drive more than the gas you have in your car? Balance. Don't eat more than you should. Because if you look like a balloon, you're out of balance. Now, please don't get mad at me. We're so oversensitized about things. Look, our lives are way out of line anytime we get away from God doesn't matter what it with. We will always mess up. We always bumble or stumble around. We're the bumbles. But with God, we're champions. So we need to have a sobering thought that I am not worth a dime without God. Now, don't overdo that and start running yourself down. But say, Lord, I need you. Every hour I need you. I want to thrive with you. I want to see as you see. I want to forgive as you forgive. And you start praying like that, man, your life will take on a whole world of blessings you never experienced. All right, let's go to point two, shall we? You getting anything out of this? You see, now, a lot of places, not to put anybody down, but a lot of places, they teach psychology, not the word anymore. They tell you four steps of what you should be doing and be a good boy and practice these things. Pat you on the back and burp you and off to go. No. 
I'm going to challenge you to become a doer of the word because the only thing that's working in your life is what you practice. Hello? If you're not practicing the word, then the other parts are not working that well. You put God first because he lines up all the seconds. Not you. He does. You have a business? He's lining up the work just as I speak. He's lining it up. Now he wants to hear praise. Are you with me? Yeah. All right. I'm going to take you to Job chapter 31, verse 6 and 7. Talking about balance just quickly, and then we'll go to our second point. If nothing else, write the address down, and then you can go back and study it later. It says, let me be weighed on an honest scales, that God may know my integrity. If my step has turned from your ways, oh, my heart, walk after my own eyes, or if a shot, or if, excuse me, or if any spot adheres to my hands. He's saying, Lord, judge me. Let me be weighed so that, and, and so you think about that. Wow, that's pretty heavy. Everyone say weight is worth. Worth is weight. Now, see, so you're interested in the English where weight means how heavy. But in, in the original understanding, weight meant how much are you worth in weight? How much are you guys worth? You're priceless. Would a priceless person that God wants to be with him forever, it'd be a real waste for us to turn our ways away from the Lord, huh? And to see this beautiful worth, worth person that God is making out of us fall away. And of course, God forbid, say amen. So we got to learn to keep our priorities. Say amen. Now, a lot of people think they got a handle on priorities, and I believe probably you do. But priorities I see in my mind is first things first. Who's first in your life? Come on, everybody, tell me. God's first. You'll know it right away after this sermon when you're not putting God first from this day forward. God will say, well, well you started off your day without talking to me. How many here know it's very important to talk to God before you start off your day? Because in a day has two things. It has a bunch of junk that you don't want and a bunch of goodies that God wants you to have. And the only way you're going to get your hands on the goodies is you better pay attention to the shepherd that leads you there. Say, oh, me. Whoa, me. All right. So keeping our priorities right. God has to be first. So let me break this down. I broke it down for this simplistic idea of understanding, okay? Now, your first priority is God. Amen. That means Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Let me tell you about God. God the Father has never got up from his throne. Because if he does, he wouldn't be God anymore. So he's above all, through all, and in all. Jesus is the active member. He's the Jehovah. He's all the active words that operate that you read in the Old Testament. Jehovah, Nisi, Jehovah, Jireh. That's why Jesus and Jehovah are the same. Now, people are taught that Jehovah is the Father. But if that's so, then the Father's gotten off his throne and he's running around like a banshee. He's in absolute charge. He can't get off your, your throne. You have to be in charge. Jesus is the one. So Father thought it, Jesus spoke it, and the Holy Spirit brought it to pass. Amen. Now, do you know why God was so ticked at mankind because of sin? I, I bet you you don't. Do you know why God was so mad he wanted to destroy the human race and that said Jesus came to stop the wrath of God on us? And give us grace instead of the wrath. Come on. God the Father already, already put us to death. 
But Jesus came to where we were, and he interceded, and he turned around and said, Father, those that accept me, you will accept. That's why we lead people to the Lord, because they're not going to make it if they don't have Jesus in their heart. So you better get Jesus in their heart. What if they curse you? What if they curse you? Get Jesus in their heart. God doesn't want to miss his family. The reason why God was so angry at human, human beings is because he gave Adam a complete, perfect life. And Adam kissed the devil's butt. And he sold us out. That's why God's anger was so bad. How could you do this to my son who created you? See, the father thinks that Jesus created us. The Holy Spirit brought us into existence. So when we, when we sinned, we insulted God, his son, and we spit in his face. No wonder he was angry. But aren't you glad we didn't receive his wrath? We received God's grace through who? Through who? Jesus Christ. For grace and peace and truth come through Jesus Christ. So we need to walk close to him so the Father's favor sticks to us. And folks, let me, let me tell you, especially those coming in by broadcast, God hates pride. Try to be a humble child of God, but confident, but don't be prideful. Because <clears throat> the moment we do, I said we, we hit the bottom. Because Satan was the first prideful person. Look what destruction he brought. And then Adam followed suit afterwards. So God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. We humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift us up. You see, he lifts us up. If he's lifting you up, Satan can't knock you down. But if we lift ourselves up, we can't stumble. Are you ready? So keeping our priorities. So God is first, and he's broke down in these things. God is broke down in your development with him on worship and praise. How's your worship and praise? It should be first in your life. How's your word life? The word is Jesus. Jesus is the word. So you need to be in the word sometime every day, just a little bit, doesn't be all much, so he can write your thinking. You have a standard. So God first is worship of God, praise of God, the word of God, prayer. I'll go over again if you need to. And the last is one everybody forgets. The gathering together uh, into church. There is no thing, nothing in scripture that says you can stay home and not come to church. And if you're staying home because you feel bad or you don't feel worthy, then who's on your mind? Is it God? No, you are on your mind. I would have, if I could have, I should have. Oh, would have, could have, should have, would have, could have, should have, would have, could You cannot drive your life by looking in the rear view mirror. Some people, if you listen to them, they, all they ever talk about is those good old days, which weren't so good. <laughs> Come on now, shout amen, somebody. I sure love you. Okay, so let's get into this. Keeping our priorities right. So church, having our priorities right will keep us under the favor of God, under his blessings. Two, so here are our priorities. Should we, it's how we should be, how we should act, how we should line up with God. It should be God first, family second. God first, family second, job third. And ministry last, or you last. Where should you be on that list? Last. God should be first. Taking care of your family should be second. And you can't do that with some, without a job. Taking care of the job. So what happens? So let's say you're working so hard on your job, you haven't got any time to be with God. You're out of your priorities. Your favor is stopped. Stop 
and say, God, I'm sorry. Whoops. <laughs> God wants the priorities lined up right because he's got an accuser that accuses you day and night before him. So he needs for you to hold fast to what is true and keep your priorities lined up. Say amen. amen. God first, family second, job third. You are last. If you're ministering, my ministry comes second to my wife. Now, in family second, that means your spouse, then children. So it's God first, family second, spouse, then children. Don't let your children get between you and your spouse. Priorities are messed up. When you do that, Satan just loves it. Shuts down the favor. Folks, we go through four seasons as a Christian. And these seasons change all the time. There's no four months this season and five months this... There's nothing like that. It has to do with our attitude and our focus. There's... Spring, summer, winter, and fall, or autumn. What happens in a tree is in springtime, everything grows. It, during the summertime, everything produces fruit. And then at the end of the summer, it cuts back. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. So you'll bear more fruit. Then there's a time where everything is not so active around you. It's more reflective in you. The tree refocuses and gets ready to produce more fruit during that autumn shutdown time. And then we go through a winter. Winter time, you don't see any, hardly any outward things, but that's where we, the tree grows the most. All the develops are happening on the inside of that tree. So if I can't get you to God where he can work your tree, then you're going to be a retard when you grow older. What do you mean by that? You'll never develop spiritually. How many Christians do you know still cuss the fly paper off the wall, smoke cigars, cuss, drink, and party, and they say they love Jesus? There's a child that's never grown up. Say, oh, me, somebody. Now, I, I'm not preaching at you. Remember, I don't preach at you. I preach up. You catch what you can catch. It's not what you hear. It's what you catch. Throw it back. You can do it. See, we hear a lot of stuff, but are we really paying attention and listening? All right. I, bl I bless you. How many here's got priorities kind of lined up already? I don't need to hammer this too much. So who's first in your life? Let me ask you, how's your prayer life? Man, if you're, if you're, if you're in these last days and you don't have a prayer life, goodbye. You're going home early because you won't have the strength to sustain what's coming. But don't put your eyes on what's coming. Put your eyes on Jesus so we can win souls and touch lives out of this mess. Our job is to collect fish, people, and get them out of the world, get them into Jesus. If you're not doing that, your Christianity is not whole. That's why we get stale and often go through excess amount of trials because we're not doing what God first told us, going to all the world and preach the gospel. Are you with me? So those priorities are very important in your family. The Bible says if you don't take care of your family, you're worse than an unbeliever. That means you got to get a job, you got to provide. Do you have a home for your family? How about a place where, you see, women, they don't need to just be loved. They need to know they have a safe place to dwell. Guys, ladies, let me tell you about the guys. We don't want to get... We don't want all the lovey-dovey stuff like we think we want. We want respect. If you give us respect, you'll have all the lovey-dovey stuff you can get. So if you will read Ephesians 5 when it talks about the family, and we're going to cover that, there's some real key treasures about yielding to one another, how to yield to one another in the church, and how to, how to you know, complement one another in these things. So there's certain priorities that we need to have so that the flow of grace continues to go. Can you say amen? amen? How panicked do you feel when somebody asks you to do something, you commit to doing it, and then you found out you have no gas in your car? <gasps> you go, I got to get gas, I got to get gas, right? How many of you ever found that you were like wanting and, 
and things weren't going quite right, you got to get gas in your car. Meet with God. Talk to him about all your stuff. Well, he knows a lot of this stuff already. He didn't say complain. He just simply said for you to get, agree with his word, ask him to get involved, and get out of the way. Can you do that? Yes, I can do that. Then start out. Start after it. You can do it. You're a champion. Keep our priorities right. Church, having our priorities right causes the grace to flow. God being first in our lives the key is of breaking it down and understanding how he wants things. And then the other point I'm going to give you is we become the very last on our list. It isn't what I want. I found out that if my wife and I have what we call intense fellowship, you know what that is, when we disagree on something. We never, we never escalate it. We never have fights and yelling and screaming because we know that feeds the devil. But we will at times not agree on things. So what we do is we agree to disagree and we pray together so that the enemy has no inroads to get in. You know, you're very precious. And as far as Linda and I are concerned, we don't want the enemy harassing you at all. So we pray for you on a daily basis. Now, Kevin, we're going to add to this list, his family. But I do that. And you say, well, how can you remember everybody? After a while, you remember everybody. He just lays it on your heart. I don't pray long for you, but I do pray God does everything that's needed in your life according to what he sees is needed and not just your wants. And I pray him in. I pray him into your children, your grandchildren, your, everything you can imagine, your, your mom, your dad, your sisters, your brothers. Why? Because, you know, I'm not stupid. If I pray for you like that, then I know that you're going to pray for me like that. And as we sow, so shall we. And as we reap, so shall we sow. And it keeps on going. It builds up like a snowball. Pretty soon we're sucking in people and people want to come see what's going on here. Glory to God. Don't keep your mouth shut. My God, if God has healed you of something, you tell everybody in your family, you get that word out. You might feel a little intimidated about it, but you do it because you're telling them about eternal life in Jesus. All right, let's go to our third point. Woo, hallelujah, don't preach myself happy. All right, our witness and our behavior. How many know that we need to be conscious of how we come across to others? Yes, yes. I had a guy say to me, he says, I don't care what people think. I'm going to just follow God. I said, you're just in error right now. Stop. Because number one, the two commandments is to love the Lord thy God with your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as I have loved you. That's the New Testament. Old Testament, as you love yourself. In New Testament, as I have loved you. You see, because in the Old Testament, a lot of people didn't love themselves. How could they love someone else? As Jesus loves us. So we think about that. Our witness and our behavior, we come across certain ways, so we need to realize we can say a right thing the wrong way. Hello? We could say something wrong the right way. You know, come on. Take a look at some of these salesmen. That last car you bought that you really didn't need. Hello? Gee, it sounds like you're selling your shirt right off in my home back. <laughs> That's what the devil does. You'll pull out a list and say, hey, you got a little sniffle. Let me read the list to you. Cold, flu. Maybe it's COVID. It just goes through a list. Studying you making the stand and rebuking it. Say amen. So our witness, our behavior. Go with me to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You guys can memorize this. Jesus said, go to Jerusalem and wait for the endowment of power from on high. Then he says in Acts 1, 8, and you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. It's such a mystery. Because... When the Holy Ghost comes upon us, he clothes us with God's clothing. You don't have some spook on your shoulder. You've got God's clothing, robes of righteousness. So he says, go to Jerusalem. Not only are you going to be saved, you're going to be spirit-filled, but my spirit's going to come down on you for ministry. And you'll be witnesses for me in Jerusalem Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth, Puyallup, Oregon. Can you say amen? amen? 
we're anointed by God to share about the Lord. You stop sharing about the Lord, and you're going to get stale. We'll change your name to Dale. You'll need to get bailed. You see, we're not living for ourselves anymore. So you still with me? So our behavior and our witness are very important. God wants us to be a witness. The word witness is the Greek word, if you're writing anything down, it's the Greek word martyr. It means somebody that will either prove what they know, hear, and see, and they will even live unto death about it. A martyr, witness. You are a witness of Jesus Christ, and you are willing to die for him if necessary. How many can say amen to that? You know, death is, is not something I'm afraid of anymore. No, there's no reason to be afraid. It's graduation day. You see, but a lot of Christians, they have fears and all that. And let me say this to you if you're looking in. Fear is not of God. Fear is the tool of the enemy. And the Bible says perfect love casts off fear. So Jesus is love. God is love. The closer you get to God, the less fear you'll have. Hello? The farther you wait, I walk away into your own things, the more the enemy will try to sell you on fear. What if? What if this doesn't come? What if that doesn't come? What, 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 what? Oh, be careful. You know, you never know what you Shut up. Calm down. That's how your mind is. Get a hold of that mess. God didn't say any of those things. And we'll be finishing up with the eye. I think I got the message. The <clears throat> it's time to move along. All right. I love you, dear. Our witness of behavior. Go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3, 15 and 16. Look what it says. But if I am delayed, Paul's saying, I want to come to you, but I'm, if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself. How many know it's our witness and behavior? We need to know in church there's a certain way we need to conduct ourselves. When we're around our family, you don't walk into my house without knocking. That's the wrong kind of conduct. You, you get it. Amen. So look what it says as we read on Timothy. They know how to conduct themselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground work of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mysteries of God. Get to know God and he'll show you his mysteries. Then in Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16, he says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a bushel or under a lamp, under a bushel or a bed. But they put it on a lampstand so all that see the light may enter the room. You are the light of the world. Job, what God does with you, that is if your life is full of integrity, he'll put you out where everybody can see you. So that your happiness, your joy, your fruit of the spirit will illuminate and give hope to the people that don't have that. Hello. You're supposed to cause people to want to be jealous of your relationship with God. To want to have that. Stop walking around with a frown on your face. Say, would you like to be a Christian like me? <laughs> I'm so caught up in myself and what's not going on. And, and when I pray, I'm complaining instead of telling God, come and meet my need. So he says, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. But he says... So let your light shine before who? Men. Well, I thought God doesn't want us to do it for the sight of men. No, that's not what he's talking about. You do it for the Lord, and he will make you shine before men. You put God first, and he'll make you first before men. You put him first in your business, and he'll make your business first in his life. Come on, folks, we need to be smart. And not El Stupo religious people. I tell you what, religion, Jesus hated it with a passion. 
They're the ones that said crucify him. And there's a lot of religious stuff going on right now. Here, here's one. You never know what God's going to do, brother. You just hold on to the end. He'll work something out with you. That is so far from the pit. That's just what the devil wants us to think that God is Jing, both evil and good, both doing us harm and helping us. And somehow in the middle of this mystery, he's working out something for our good. What a bunch of bunk. That stinketh from high heaven, dude. And you know, two-thirds of the church are teaching it. If you don't believe, take an interview. Listen to the sermons. What is coming across the pulpit? Is it Jesus? Is it hope? Is it faith? Is it something we can get our hands on? Something that we can change our lives? Or is it just be a good person? God's going to help you through, brother. Be warmed, be filled, be blessed. I know I'm hamming it up a bit, but that's where people are. Listen, I want your life to be so good. I want you to be so blessed that hire me to drive your limo around. See, I'm, I'm a humble man. I, I have been on the streets. I know what it's like to scrape my last meal asking for spare change. I went from very, very, very being very wealthy and, and famous, semi-famous, to living on the streets, wondering where my meal was going to come from. And you know what? God said to me, this is temporary. I said, good. <laughs> you see, when you take your own life in your own hands, disaster is the result. I know. But when I give my life back to God, he takes disaster and he makes it into something that blesses his name. Are you with me? Last point. Whew, thank God this man preaches a lot. Got to turn my page here. Press onward and upward. How many know that's correct? Listen, we're in a race. You can't stop and look around. When you're running, you can't look back. You have to focus on the finish line. That's where a lot of the church fails. They're looking at everything but the finish line. Sure, they can tell you what's wrong in America. And they can tell you what people are doing wrong. And, and they're irritated at the church down the street because... Nah, 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 nah. And you know what? You're just powerless dribble. Satan has got a number on you. It's time we rise up and be who we're supposed to be. Say amen. amen. All right, finishing with you. Press onward and upwards. Philippians chapter 3, 12 through 15. Not that I have already attained, Paul says. One thing I already have known, that I am already perfected, I have not obtained, but I press on. I haven't got everything yet. I press on that I may lay hold on that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold for me. My job is to cling on to God. Now, here's one. How you doing there, brother? I'm just hanging in there. What's wrong with this picture? You see the little cat holding in the bar or they're just hanging on there? What's wrong with that picture? They're doing it. Uh -uh. You don't hang on. God hangs on to you. Because you made the wonderful request of him doing that. See, if it was up to my own strength, I would fail every time. But I surrender my own strength and take on his. That's what covenant means. Amen. I'm just glad you're here, brother. <laughs> All right, so you with me. Brethren, I do not... Count myself as have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Everyone take note. And reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if anybody else disagrees, God will even reveal this to you. Are you with me? 
everything God has planned for you is good. The reason why we don't have all the good yet is we're not seeking them maybe like we should and get into instructions. Don't feel condemnation. Just go after it. Pastor Kerry always wants to encourage you. My job is not to beat you with the word, but encourage you. There are plenty of things you haven't tasted yet. You got to go after them. And you say this, Lord, there's a lot of things you want to show me, God, and I don't know where first to ask. So I'm asking you show me as many things as you need for me to know. How about that? What have you given God? When you pray that prayer, what have you given God? Invitation to do that very thing. I'm going to tell you one more story. Remember my father? What a wonderful guy. I had a good, good father. And it was a, a miracle of God. And they were very supportive to me. One day I drove up to my parents' house. My dad's really irritated. He has a face like mine. You can tell. Some people have demonstrative faces. You can tell what they're thinking right on their face. Come on, laugh with me. So he's sitting there, his back on his Volkswagen. He's upset. I said, Dad, what's the matter? He says, my hand's too big to get back there and do the last parking spark plug in that Volkswagen Beetle. I said, being his son, why don't you ask God? Just like that. Why don't you ask God to help you? Out of his mouth came... You got to realize that some people out of the abundance of their heart, their mouth locates them. And, and he said, oh, I don't want to bother God with something little like that. I said, ask him. He loves to help. I walked in, made myself a sandwich and visited with my mom. Our home was really, really loving and very open and visiting. And maybe you had that too. So by the time I finished my sandwich, visited my mom, came out, my dad's grin ear to ear. Tears coming off his face. And I didn't even need to say anything to him. I knew what had happened. I said, you asked God, didn't you, Dad? He said, oh, real boy, I am. He says, I reached back there to grab the spark plug. It fell out in my hands. Now, the purpose of telling that story one more time is, bother God about everything. Just don't complain to him because he's given you life. The one that's messed it up is you. So don't complain to him about what you've messed up. Go to him and say, please fix it, Lord, and help me to be a good listener and an obedient child so I can follow you through this mess that I have created. So let's go through these points. Did you get something out of that this morning? Yeah. Amen. Take it home with you. Get these notes. But let me just go over this again. Thing is our witness and our behavior. You can't, I can't be rude to you and get in the presence of God and be blessed. Hello. So I need to watch what I say, how I say it. So I learned several, I mean, lots of years ago, not to preach at people anymore. You know, and I had in my heart, I'm confessing a fault, that I wanted people to get it so bad I'd rip their head off and and shove it down their throat if they, did, if they were smart Alex about it. But you know, if you think about it, how often have you wanted your child to catch something or find out about a certain truth? And it, they, they're just not getting it. Well, God had to bring me past that in my life to share the word of God and to pray that you'll catch it, just like the football. Amen. And then finally, press onward and upward. Keep those as your goal. Father, bless them, keep them, strengthen them. Help them, Lord God. There was somebody in here, Father, that you healed of um, uh, chest pains. It's not any bad chest pains, just a little bit of angina there. You've taken that, and they can breathe deeply now. And if that's you, just breathe deeply. Um, somebody had received, I forget what it is, but it's, a, it's like a, a flu cold thing. God is... Kill that in your body, and now you'll find yourself speedily recovering. You are watching by film. And so the rest of you, be blessed, be nurtured, follow God, and become a, a part of God's rescue plan and winning souls and touching lives. In Jesus' name, have a great day. <laughs>